<sighs> Damn, Q. Maybe you did that. Welcome to the Oh Yeah Podcast with your boy, Mr. Oh Yeah, Detroit's number one ambassador. Appreciate you joining us for another episode of Real Stories from Real People. episode of the oh yeah podcast with your boy mr oh yeah detroit's number one ambassador and as you can see uh we're not at our normal place today uh, it, it was definitely a worthy move to get on out of the uh, uh floods environment but please don't forget to come check us out every wednesday for uh, all industry connect or wednesday night live uh, as we got a lot of things lined up coming up in the next couple of weeks that you definitely want to be there uh, shout out to our sponsor as well, Candidly Speaking, for always showing us the support, um, even on the road. Uh, and, and when I say on the road, we ain't left the city of Detroit, y'all, but we had to come pay a visit to what is considered to be one of the brightest low-key gems in our city right now. And we're honored to have uh, the guest or the creator of this road, excuse me, let's be specific, John R. Rowe. That's right. With the creator himself, Stephen Harris. How you doing today, sir? I'm great. I'm great. Welcome to the Oh Yeah podcast. Uh, we appreciate you taking a little time out to hang out with us a little bit, but more importantly, your hospitality to let us hang out on John R. Rowe here at uh, the Cigar uh, Lounge Private. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, your hospitality is, is, is A1, man. So we appreciate you letting us camp out with you a little bit. No today. doubt. Thanks for coming. Man, Thanks how you coming. feeling? Feeling great. I'm uh, feeling we great. like to hear that. Well, yeah. we, we want to go ahead and start off on just that, with us just being here. You're the creator of this, uh, uh, what I would like to say, revitalization through our city. And, and we'd like to just hear what prompted the John R. Rowe, uh, and, and, you know, what sparked the idea and what got you here, man? Well, um, once again, thanks for having me. Um, I'm, I'm always excited and blessed when people even start recognize what we've been doing over here. Yeah. Uh, people think it's just me, but it's actually I have a team of people behind me. Yeah. But um, I have been making a lot of different moves and mainly the north end but a lot around the city uh <clears throat> so a little background i am born and raised in this north end area right. uh every now and then i have moved over in the Linwood area okay. which isn't too far away yeah and uh a great story about that um just um going back and forth from the north end where i'm born and raised over yeah. to the north end I would always detour and go through Boston Edison to get that way. Okay. Although I'd have to come eight blocks this way and then go across and then go almost eight blocks back. Yeah. But I just always had this fascination with historical homes and Detroit yeah. and just the uh, all the layers of Detroit and the history of the neighborhoods. And um, uh, I never thought it was super violent or crazy as a kid. I just thought... You know, um, we just had some real, true, hardcore people that always looked out for me or for their okay. neighborhood. So yeah. I um, I took on a lot of those characteristics. But going through this Boston Edison neighborhood always uh, inspired me to become an architect at, yeah. at a really early age. So um, that's what uh, sparked me to start studying architecture when I got to uh, high school. Okay. Uh, I could have went to Northern over here. I did go to Northwestern for a half semester, but uh, I went all the way over to Cody. Uh, actually, at the time, 
my mother and some family members thought it was just safer over on that side of town, okay. which I thought I was in Southfield, yeah. but it yeah. was on Plymouth and Southfield Road. Okay. <laughs> but and it was still a little diverse over there. But um, so that's where I started studying architecture. Okay. And uh, and wind up leaving, going to school. Uh, well, I went to the Marine Corps for eight years. Yeah. You know, four years active, four years reserves, and. Um, then when I came back, I had a short little stint of just trying to find my way out here okay. in the streets yeah. and uh, finally made it to Henry Ford Community College, get an associate's degree, and then I got a bachelor's and master's from Lawrence Tech. Here we go. And, uh, well, don't but, give them too much now. Hold yeah, on. Hold yeah, on. So that's what back. led me to doing the work that I do. Okay. Right. Which, let, let's go ahead and say all that. An architect. Uh, contractor, uh, uh, you've been known throughout li your life of being a creator, so to speak, and being able to revitalize certain, you know, aspects of the neighborhood, but uh, buildings and whatnot, and mm -hmm. that, which led you to architecture, yeah. right? Uh, yep. But John R. Rowe specifically, what is all inclusive of this road here? Um, John R. Rowe, um, it has uh, black coffee, which okay. is a... a uh, coffee shop and yep. cafe um, and we specialize in in African pour over so really dope little spot there okay um, then we have transformation barbershop uh, which we're trying to turn that more into an upscale men's grooming company okay and then uh, next door to that is red shoeshine red shoeshine been in the north end uh, for over 70 years yeah. he was over on Oakland but he's been over here for about three years now. Um, and then we have a place called Pink Elephant that sell all natural products, recycled products, uh, just all holistic um, things for the neighborhood. And then finally right here, uh, we have Bird's uh, Private Cigar Lounge with Rosemary Restaurant below. So uh, that, that's this whole block yeah. where we initially started with $10,000 and was able to buy this whole building and, you know, just started transforming uh, the whole block with just a barbershop in six months. In so, six months. Yep, six months we had the barbershop open. Yeah. Three months after that we had old fashioned candy store. So my whole thing is I just like to create uh, a better quality of life in a neighborhood and a, a, a place where we can walk to get our goods and services. Come on now. And that's, that was the main purpose of me purchasing this block and across the street. Uh, and it was kind of a challenge, a neighborhood challenge. I was on this North End governance board yeah. and I just want to show them that, you know, all this stuff we talk about in these meetings, I'm going to show you how you can blink, bring it to fruition. It wouldn't cost a lot. Right. So uh, I take pride in designing on a dime. So okay. I don't put a ton of money yeah. into everything, but I try and make it look like it's worth a million dollars. And this does, man. I mean, that's to say the least. We're in this place and it, it doesn't look like it's second class to anything, man. So that, that, that's amazing. And, and we definitely gonna check out the rest of the establishment down this way. But what year was it when you actually purchased the property here? Uh, I purchased this in 2011. Okay. And in yeah. six months, you were able to have the barbershop. The barbershop was open. It was open. Yep. Ready to go. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, you're from this area, grew I up am. in this area. And, yep. and maybe if we could, you know, kind of go there, what was life like growing up over here in the north end of Detroit for you? Oh, man. Uh, I don't want to go too far in depth, but okay. I would, you know, I went to. Uh, elementary school over here, Brightmire, and then Sherrod Junior High School. Okay. Uh, you know, I grew up in like maybe seven foster homes. Okay. In this North End area. Wow. Uh, you know, to my mother, kind of had some challenges, and yeah. she'd get on her feet, and we'd go get us a place over by Linwood. And, okay. You know, if I, we had some more missteps, uh, I'd be back over here with, so I, I'll say all that to say that, um, it literally, I'm a product of like where it say, takes a village to raise a child. Come on now. That's exactly my story. Yeah. And um, kind of humbled by it because uh, um, 
I always wanted family on my own, but I actually had a lot of different families okay. that taught me a lot of different things, especially about entrepreneurship. Yeah. So a lot of the households I was living in, it was single black mothers and that was entrepreneurs that wow. sold dinners, yeah. sold pies, candies. My grandmother sold quilts. My mother made ceramics, but okay. it was all entrepreneurship. Yeah. It was rare that I knew somebody that literally worked a job. And if they did, it was kind of a factory job. But yeah. back to your question, like just this neighborhood was, it was rare that you see a vacant lot. Okay. There's a lot more apartment buildings. You always heard this buzz about how wonderful Boston that is. Edison was a right. Boston Arden Park right here. Right. Uh, it's big church, but like I say, no vacant houses, kids everywhere, community, uh, very tight knit. All these stories that you sound very cliche, like you going down a, you know, your friend's house and you can eat over their house yeah. and then you can, y'all all meet up, man. It was so rare now, but it was very normal to be able to get 18 people to play nine on nine baseball. <laughs> I mean, right. easily, easily, every day. Yeah, I have never, I haven't seen that in 20 years right. or more. Yeah. And so, it's unfortunate, but. Yeah, it is, and you know, we didn't have all those distractions back then. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our big uh, uh, weekend event was to actually be able to scrape up a few bucks and go to Woolworths okay. right there on Woolworths yeah. and the Boulevard, yeah. man. It was like, if you could go up to Woolworths and grab you something and come back. You and, was doing something. Yeah, man, you, you <laughs> was. So, and one thing I, I learned to appreciate when I got older was how broke everybody was That's around right. me. You know, so you didn't feel so bad because, yeah. you know, everybody, everybody was, was trying broke. to put twos and together. Yeah, ev everybody. Yeah. You know, so. That's what the 70s was like. Okay. 80s came with the drug game. Yeah. Everybody kind of got caught up in that. But 86 is when I went to the Marine Corps. Okay. To kind of get away from a lot of that. Okay. Uh, came back to it. Right. You know, it was still thriving, just same as when I left. When you left. That, yep. Yeah. So. That business was still oh, booming. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what it was like, man. Okay. It was my friends, or everybody was getting money at the time, hustling. Yeah. Babysitters was getting money. Yeah. Grandma was doing the numbers. Right. <laughs> you know, so it was just. It's uh, funny. I, I say this to, to all our guests uh, as we have in this conversation and always try to go back to more of the roots. Uh, but I always, and I'm seeing it right now, it's almost like you envisioning it again. Mm -hmm. It's like you can actually see the people yeah. moving and the 909 playing baseball and going yeah. to Woolworths. You actually see all that right now, don't oh, you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you still encounter some of those friends or families or whatnot in the neighborhood now? Or what? Yeah, yeah. I, I do. Um, it's, it's, um, it's rare. Uh, we don't really come together like we used to Yeah. because I just think we all got our own separate things going on. Everyone right. got a different business or different priorities or distractions. Yeah. Uh, so, but every now and then, uh, I can name maybe about 10, 15 people right. that I grew up with on a regular basis around here yeah. uh, that either come visit me here, right. have a cigar, have a drink, throw they had a had a Christmas party here, their birthday party, their okay. wedding reception or uh, repass, you know, people find all type of reason yeah. to enjoy a good drink and a that's stick and some, come and on some now. good food. Come on now. So, oh, that, that sounds like a, a, a recipe for a great party, oh, man. man. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I like it. Like a, something that really hit home for me a couple of weeks ago was uh, I was meeting um, the Senator Booker from okay. New Jersey yeah. was over around the corner at my friend Adam's house, who state rep, yep. uh, uh, state senator. And uh, Bill McConaughey, who's the chief judge at 36th District, said, man, yeah, you got to meet this guy, yeah. Booker. And I was like, hey, he talking about me. But he's like, yeah, I walk a half a block. 
I get my coffee, I get my haircut, my shoe shine, and then I go get me a cigar and then be back home in less than two minutes. Just like that. And this is a chief judge doing this along black owned business. That's right. That's right in his neighborhood. And he feels safe and proud to to admit that. And that just really that that really just solidified the whole deal for me and the reason I've worked so hard to try and bring this area back. And let, if you don't mind me taking a step back too, because when you initially uh, 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 purchased the property, you said that it was you, you were a part of other boards. It, it was something that you were looking to do with a community of people, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So please share that story again, because I, that, that kind of inspired what prompted all this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it did. Um, so. Uh, uh, like I say, I paid my way through college building, you know, rehabbing houses yeah. and building houses. But when I became an architect, I was just working and I moved back here because I was part of a team that built Motor, designed Motor City Casino. So I was just looking for different ways to be active in the community. So I became yeah. a part of this North End Governance Board. And we were just wondering, like, how can we all come together to help bring our neighborhoods back or not to let others come in and just do what they want in our neighborhood. Yeah. They had to come through us. We wanted to be a board like you come and see us and get permission right. to do what you want to do in our neighborhoods. Come on, man. So we would have all these meetings. You know, we had like a $250,000 stipend from Skillman Foundation. Okay. And man, we were just ordering pizza and salad <laughs> and we was just meeting to have meetings. Yeah. And we were talking about this economic development and all this. I said, man, I want to show you guys how to do it. The way you eat an elephant, you know, is one bite at a time. And I said, I'm going to show you how you could do one property at a time, one block at a time, and then one neighborhood at a time. So I bought this property right here. So we were meeting at Vanguard, which is a nonprofit up the street. We was meeting that neighbor, and that's where my office is. Uh, And... um, I told everybody it's ten thousand dollars. You know, it's nine of us. We can all put in about a thousand dollars a piece, yep. and we can have this place, and it will be ours as a group. Yeah. You know, and uh, we'll open a trust, and you know, we'll re, you know, get the barbershop back going, yeah. and we'll pay ourselves back. And so everyone was happy and geeked up, and but nobody put any <laughs> money put in. That money down. Not one person. <laughs> So I bought it. Yeah. I just went into, actually, I probably had some money put up in a 401k or yeah, yeah. something, man, and I bought it. Right. And then I told them I bought it, and they was like, well, we was going to go in, too. I said, well, we had plenty of time. I said, I'll tell you what, since you was going to go in, the four-family flat across the street is available for yeah. 10000 You want to do that one? Let's do that. Let's do that one. Back on the table. Once again, not, not one single. person. <laughs> but I, I mean, we laugh and not, but it was so disheartening at the time because I was yeah. sitting on city boards for city like uh, future cities and how the city is going to shrink yeah. uh, from the suburbs and co- so I knew what was coming. Right. Because I was part of this little think tank right. on how the sh- city should move yeah. architecturally. Yeah. And I wind up buying that. So uh, before you know it, I had two of, two of those units ready for rent and I was doing low income, you know, cause it was tight yeah. during those times, yeah. uh, 2010, whatever, 11, 12. But um, so then it came a point where the city went into a recession. It was terrible. We all know what happened yeah. before Obama came in office. Right. So I, everyone's getting laid off. But all the properties was worth a minimum of five hundred dollars to twenty thousand. Like I'm talking about, yeah. you could buy a ten story apartment building for twenty five thousand right. dollars. Right. You know. So. Yeah. But people was like, I don't want that stuff. Yeah. Is it cool? It was turning in here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're yeah cool. like, I don't want that bullshit. Yeah. You know, fuck Detroit. Yeah. That shit. I'm moving. I'm yeah. trying to get away from there. Trying to get away. I said, Nah. Right. You don't know what's about to happen. I'm Come telling on you, because I'm in the room with these people that's making these decisions. That's right. So 
uh, I thought I was going to get laid off. So long story short, I, I probably picked up about 10, 15 more properties and never got laid off. Yeah. And that was because the firm I was with, they had to keep someone black in there, they had to. you know, because, <laughs> Check. you know, yep, they had, they had to, to That's do right. business in Detroit. You couldn't just have not one black person. That's right. So working on Motor City Casino, you yeah. know, I was the token. And it was cool. It worked out for me, yeah. but I was stuck with these properties that I was just working on at night. And before you know it, now I'm doing, I had owned property in the past, yeah. but now I'm really building a team of guys and the guys uh, that I was able to afford happen to fit in one of the three categories that start representing my nonprofit, which is Rebound CDC. Come on now, hold on a second. We about to go there. Okay. We about to go there. Let's be clear. You paid your way through college. Uh, you did, you said, what was it, four years in the military? Four years active, four years reserve, so four a total years of eight years. When you came back home and you went back to your passion. I want to be an architect, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I think we may have discussed this before, but it was Cody that had a program. Yeah. Yep. And you were able to go through that program at, at Cody and then take it to uh, Lawrence, Lawrence Tech, Tech, right? Yeah. Tell yeah. us about that walk and, and what kept you committed to that plan of becoming an architect. Oh, man. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try and keep that one short and sweet as well. <laughs> you know, I, I really don't think about this stuff until yeah. someone like you ask me about it, you okay. know. But, um so Cody and Cass was the only two schools had architectural programs. Uh, and I went to Cody. I wound up going to Cody, uh, which worked out great. Uh, wound up going to the Marines out of, at 17. And um, uh, the only thing I really learned to do well was shoot. I was, so I became, I was a Marine sniper okay. for eight years. Um, no, well, I was going back and forth in the, in the reserve to different conflicts. Okay. And um, so uh, when I got out, I still wanted to be an architect. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I started at Lawrence, I mean, Henry Ford Community College. Uh, start running with my old crew of guys. Started doing some of the same things they was doing, hustling in the yeah. street. So yeah. I, I told this story before. It's like uh, it took me six years to get my associate's degree because yeah. I kept dropping out because I was making so much money in the streets. Right. A lot of money in the North End, a lot of money on Linwood. Yeah. You know, um, so that's just what was going on at the time. Yeah. And I was very good at it. Yeah. You know, especially with my training my my government training right. made me very successful in these streets but yeah. um but like i said uh i got shot up really bad and was able to sit down for a nice little period of time and that's when i wound up getting an associate's degree bachelor's degree and master's degree while i was in trouble too yeah uh so um, that actually the worst time in my life became the best time because if I had not got shot and caught a case at the same time, I, and my lawyer or whatever, like, you need to just stay in school, man. Yeah. I don't want to hear shit else about you right. being in trouble. See, Joe, you know, I had my paperwork was this thick. Yeah. They were stapling shit to the back of my right. papers and work. Right. So I was like, man, so I... So really the, the truthful part is like, I was so used to a lot of money. I knew I couldn't get no money in the streets no more. I said, but I gotta do something. Yeah. I like, I gotta be an architect by all means necessary yeah. because I cannot be broke. I didn't want to be broke yeah. and I didn't want to go back to nobody's jail. Right. So that really inspired me yeah. to be an architect. And the bigger inspiration was I like to compete with others you know I, I like to compete with white folks yeah you know so that's why people say well you're a great you're a good black architect i'm like no nah, i'm a good architect yeah you know like compare me with everybody that's right you know what i'm saying so that actually was my motivation at lawrence tech um it was um not many black people going through the architectural program yeah so um 
Uh, but at the same time, I was working on houses and uh, to help pay for school. And um, so in a roundabout way, I came out with these two skill sets on right. knowing how to work doing construction, but also being able to design, design. and do the blueprints. So um, you're beginning to end. Yep. So I went and worked for a full time firm yeah. uh, as an intern. All you know, the whole time I was in grad school, I was in, you know, at one of the best top firms and one of the best in the country. That's right. In Southfield. And I could just walk to class at Lawrence Tech. At Lawrence Tech. So it, it, man, I'll be honest with you, man. Um, you know, when I got in trouble and was shot and a lot of things that was happening, uh, I, I, I was born again. Come on. Saved. A uh, little young girl took me to church, man, and I <laughs> wind up just joining her church. Yeah. Became a deacon, man. I was going to church. I was in so much trouble. Yeah. And but I wasn't going to church just to help my case. I just wind up liking it. That's right. You know, and I was felt so much better and grounded and at peace being at church all the time. This is the part of the Oh Yeah podcast that we call the journey moment. Okay. This is a journey. This is the journey moment where it's that point of reflection. Mm -hmm. Because we live in a time now where social media, you know, everything, information is so fast and everybody want it so fast, mm -hmm. right? And they see the glitz, they see the glamour, they see John R. Rowe. Mm -hmm. And they naturally assume they can get it just like yeah. that. But what you just explained was you're growing up over in this neighborhood, you're, you know, understanding the street life, hell, Marines, United States government, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but staying focused on what you really want yeah, and, and, and the positivity behind that. And I don't want that to be overlooked. Yeah. I think it, it is the reason why we got John R. Rowe mm -hmm. is because of your commitment to wanting to stay clean. Right. Yeah. And staying uh, focused on what your ultimate goal was, which was being an architect. Yeah. And that's how we get to see the glitz, mm -hmm. the glamour and all that other stuff. Yeah. So I got to ask you, how does it feel? Like knowing that you are the creator of this, right? Mm -hmm. And that people can see it and you are able to do it in your neighborhood. You're able to do it in your city, you know? And to see, like you say, about 10 folks that you know you saw growing up that still come down here, they go to the barbershop, get them a coffee. Like, it, just if you could express that, like that feeling, like internally knowing that, hey, you did this shit. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, like, um, it's times like this that I really take a step back and, and think about what I have accomplished and yeah. what I've done. But on a daily grind, I'm always like, man, I'm tired of this shit. I don't even know why I'm doing this shit. Motherfuckers yeah. don't appreciate shit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I kind of get these motherfuckers a job. They yeah. won't come to work. Yeah. I try and give her just so it's that. But uh, at night, I have time to to. Uh, sit back and reflect, reflect yeah. on the bigger picture. Yeah. And uh, when I regroup and think about it, it's like it's very uh, rewarding. Come on now. Um, because I could tell you, you know, I, I just keep thinking about times when I was in the streets, you know, uh, you know, I was I was real heavy. OK. But and I was at a point where I was respected by a lot of heavy hitters in this city. Okay. But to have that same level of respect amongst real black men that's educated yeah. and family men yeah. and professionals like architects, lawyers, judges, people like yourself, yeah. um, for those men to look at me in the same light, yeah. like, damn, this dude doing it. Because when I was in the street, they're like, oh, that motherfucker doing it. He's right, killing right. him. Right, right. But here, they like, man, I want to be a part of what you're doing. How do I sign up? Like, that itself is, that's what gives me goosebumps. It's rewarding. Yeah, yeah, and to be able to, every blue moon, I have a young dude, like, man, you made me want to quit where I was working. I went out there, got my degree. I started my own, like if anybody, 
feel like that I planted any type of mustard seed Come on. to help them uplift themselves or yeah. grab themselves by the bootstraps or just adhere to our company motto, which is we say we give a hand up, not a handout. Come on. That's so if if that affect one or two people, man, or really my kids, yeah. that's that's rewarding that's enough rewarding for me. Himself. So that, that, that's amazing, man. And, and and it really speaks to what else you're doing. Because you still have your own architectural firm, correct? Yeah, yeah. And, and that is cool, right? Rebound, design, build. There we go. Rebound, design, build. This is where mm-hmm. I want to go with that because um, that's also a nonprofit as well. Where Rebound CDC is the nonprofit. Which you actually uh, uh, reach out for those who are coming out of correctional facilities yep. as well yep. to where they have a chance to get into the business, correct? Yep. We, Please we, tell us about that. Um, well, the rebound, uh, which was my thesis project, was uh, just for me coming home from yeah. jail and or and a lot of my friends all still locked up. I wanted to mm-hmm. create, architecturally, I wanted to create a facility mm-hmm. where guys could do their last 24 months Come on. or 18 months of prison at this cap is like because nonviolent criminals they were allowing them to come home on the weekend yeah. and turn themselves back in so i'm like they could come here and live and it would be self-sustainable and they can get a licensed journeyman as a plumber not one of these little bullshit certificates right. that you can get in 18 weeks i'm talking about 18 months right. you can literally be come out being a taxpaying citizen come on. with a real degree in your hand yeah. with a skill set. So that's that's where real rebound came from. Yeah. And uh, that was like I say, it was just a thesis uh, project at Lawrence Tech, and I turned it into a real life uh, experience and a, my actual name of my company. Yeah. So the nonprofit, we go after the hard to hire population, which was the um, you know, people are recently released from prison, um, chronically homeless, uh, people that have had some substance abuse issues. So those were the target area we were going for yeah. with, uh, and then training them, teaming them up with senior uh, uh, tradesmen and people with these technical skill sets, okay. and which was a huge a void in the city of Detroit. Yeah. Uh, uh, minorities having these certain skill sets to be uh, master plumbers, master electricians, master carpenters, even driving uh, heavy vehicle operators. Yeah. You know, people don't know those guys make $100 an hour, Come some on. of them. Yeah. And all you gotta do is go to school a trade school so we were targeting these people and the people that was kind of stand out we would bring them into the for-profit which is rebound design built yeah. and have them working on these abandoned houses new construction right next to an experienced guy yeah. to those guys became you know pretty productive opened their own company went into the union or stayed with us stay with y'all yep and that's to this day you're still working to this day yeah yep that's huge man and i gotta ask between um what you're doing here on john r row uh you you being within the architectural field for years now um uh, and with your rebound why detroit you could have taken this skill set and you could have been anywhere in the world we know you're a detroiter but what was it about Detroit that kept you here to feel that this investment would be not just profitable, but meaningful for you? Um, well, of course, the, mo- the thing that makes the most sense is just saying, hey, this is where I'm from. Yeah. Wanted to give back to this community yeah. that I, her- I helped cause a lot of ruckus <laughs> and pain. Yeah. I contributed to it, you know, and, uh, you know, we made up a lot of different excuses like well, why we did it. But. I felt like it would make me whole if I can uh, balance out. You know, I, I really believe in energy, yeah. the laws of karma. Yeah. So I just was trying to kind of make things right. I could have went, I had a big job offering to do a huge development deals in New Orleans after yeah. Katrina. Yeah. Uh, some other stuff in Florida, you know, I could have did 
ton after I finished Motor City Casino, I could have did all casino work in Vegas. Come on. You know, all that. But I saw a real opportunity to do what I like to do. And that's, so I don't like being a full-time architect and I don't like being a full-time carpenter. I like to be able to draw yeah. and then get up and get out and do some work. So that's why I got to design build. So I'm not just pigeonholed into drawing all day. Right. Right. So, but, um, so it felt good to be able yeah, to Yeah, man. And I've like been that. the biggest cheerleader, man, for Detroit as a kid. Like, yeah. even the Marines, anywhere I went, I'm like, man, fuck, man. I'm Detroit. <laughs> I said, motherfucker, about. we don't. Come on, baby. I, man, I be in Chicago, yeah. in the Marines, dealing with that. I said, man, we don't even hide gangs, nigga. Man, we, we rolling <laughs> crews. Yeah. We have sets of dudes of friends, and we talk yeah. about money and women. Come on. We don't throw up no colors. In California, I lived in California for four years. Yeah. I, I ran with those. They don't they don't fuck with Detroit. Right. Everywhere I go, they get Detroit props. But we just look at them like this some corny shit. <laughs> like GDs, Gangster Disciples, yeah. Vice Lord. Like I respect those dudes. Of course. Yeah. But I don't like the whole gang mentality. Okay. The beef with somebody just cause they in a rival gang, yeah. we beefed over money. Yeah. And don't come over here trying to get no money. Yeah. And we'll be all right. Yeah. But not because of what you colors or right. how you do your fingers. Like, I, the, that was, shit was it wild to me. It throws so me it just, yeah. if you ever live somewhere else, when you come back to Detroit, you just be like, man, them motherfuckers different they over different there. Down there. They man. different. They're different and over there. If yeah. you can get money and be successful in Detroit, come on. you can usually go any other way in the country or the world and get money and be all right you 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 will be all right because every they don't hustle like we do they don't man it's they so just don't man <laughs> it's just a fact and you hear it all the time yeah. man. and we, we generally rise to the crop when we in different areas as well we always do and we always do man that's what's up so, so tell me this man because you, you've been able to take all of those experiences and uh, uh, have children of your own as well. Uh, are these some of the same life experiences that you share with him or within your family? Like, how does that go? Well, that's my biggest struggle right now with all these uh, social media and these, I wish I never got my kids, you know, smartphones because it's such a distraction. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so I try to, you know, I uh, was married 10 years, but you know, she wants to be in Troy. I want to stay in Detroit. I'm okay. like, shit, go on out there. I'm, okay. I'm staying here. Yeah. And that's when it was rough, you yeah. know, and I stay, stuck it out. Right. And she's like, well, you can. And then now she see all this. She's like, man, Come I on. can't believe. Like, right. I thought this shit would take 20, 30 years, but it took 10 yeah. for it to turn around. So she don't give me no problems. So we share kids. I don't, okay. you know, we do it the easy way. Yeah. We, we are very good with our kids, but uh, I'm always trying to get them to uh, either work here, work at Cocoon, work at the coffee shop. Yeah. They run from me a lot. You know what I'm saying? Like none of them <laughs> are super thrilled, work, man. Yeah. I, I hate to say I cannot tell you no good story. And, and I can't even sugarcoat it, man. Yeah. They no nobody's really trying to walk in my shoes yeah. or like take over or <laughs> on my heels like a sponge no they they usually running from they me. running from you they yeah, see the they work like oh shit he, <laughs> like come to detroit what we gonna do what we gonna like, do I, if we just doing work shit they just want to chill lows, i'm i'm straight yeah. so but i guess they, oh i'm sorry go ahead no i i make them come though yeah I make them yeah. hang out with me. It's important. Yeah. Last time when you came here, my son was up here, yeah. uh, you know, straightening up and I let them learn about cigars. But uh, so that's still a work in progress. There ain't nothing wrong with that, man. I'm sure they'll pick it up. And I try to keep the faith of my three little ones, too, that, you know, work is what's going to get you, you know, mm -hmm. and it builds character. And it, 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 it Hopefully you're creating a platform for yourself yeah. to where you can be sustainable and take care right. of the things you want to do. Mm -hmm. So, that, that, hey, I understand it. And I guess that leads us to, you know, what's next? You know, we, we've got John on our road. You know, you, you see that there's value in continuously investing in the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. What's next for Stephen Harris and, and, and this area or, you know, what other projects should we look out for? Well, um, 
just being on the other side of 50. Now, I was calling myself just kind of putting it on cruise control <laughs> instead of. So I will tell you, I no longer work on 30, 40 million dollar projects. Okay. So I don't work on nothing that's over five million dollars. OK. So it's got to be under that because I don't want to be my whole life consumed with someone else's project yeah. or even mine. So um, with that being said, we got phase two of John R. Rowe coming in the back. It's called uh, Detroit Contained. Come on. So we're going to be doing a whole shipping container project on the back side that we've already started. Um, and it'll be uh, 40 shipping containers uh, surrounded uh, uh, around this art park. So in the middle will be a art park with a lot of local artists donating art or uh, we're gonna pay them commission several artists to do some really dope art Come on. and we'll have uh, a uh, little bandstand back there a gazebo where we'll bring tiny desk concerts to the city we got like erica badu lined up we got people like jill scott we got comedians and we're just going to do this really cool vibe but it's all going to be done in this uh old detroit feel like the 19 30s and 40s that speakeasy great gatsby like you just can be in these different shipping containers with a different dj or you just got a, a different uh lounge area where uh you can look out and or open up your window and enjoy the concert in the park and every, everything is free wi-fi yeah. uh so we got some other like really cool innovative technical park things that were going on where we have like um these interactive studios where you just have dope as artists producing really dope uh artwork for sale different medias so we got that we got musicians that we're going to create space for a studio yeah. so just this cool vibe you know it's 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 more of a destination and i won't own none of those businesses but we're just white boxing these spaces okay. to attract these type of businesses yeah so uh we got parking going on down there so that's just this campus here but the rest i'm going to continue what we had kind of started about 10 years over here is rehabbing the houses that still need to be rehabbed but we also have uh taken site control over about 35 40 other lots that we're going to put these um urban inspired houses on okay so we're not looking to put these cookie cutter houses that look like they should be in the suburbs yeah. with just vinyl siding on it. We're gonna do some stuff that look like it should have been here yeah. uh, in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Like this is an urban, this is a city, this is yeah. not the suburbs. So oh. that's what we've been working on to drop these houses in these um, vacant lots yeah. and make them somewhat affordable. Yeah. You know, uh, I've been, I tell you, I like, I like, luxury and market rate units because for 20 years I did low income yeah. so I think I've paid my debts to society yeah. on that low income okay. level there you go so, energy yeah Calm man so <laughs> I think that people like I mean just think about it like we, we do need these spaces for you know people that can't afford to live everywhere yeah. we do need those but we still have people like you that's a multimillionaire, you may want to stay in your same neighborhood. Right. So we need to build these type of houses too, where people are like, oh, sure, I'm still in the same hood, but Come on. you know, I got five bedrooms, I got a nice backyard, yeah. I got a cathedral ceiling with a, a library. Yeah. So, I mean, that's not, that shouldn't just be in Boston, that's right. sense. And we shouldn't always be just doing things for low income Man, people. Come on, now, now you, I, I, that time at the church with you being a deacon, man, I hear this preacher coming out of you right now, man, and I'm loving it. And I, from the, I'm going to take that uh, from you as the creator to, to the end. You start from the beginning to the to the end of projects, and you pointed me out as the mm -hmm. multimillionaire. So if you mm -hmm. believe it, I'm going to take that too, yeah, man. That's <laughs> we'll right. keep working as well. What yeah. um, I, I wanted to continue to move forward on is make sure people know as we didn't mention John R. Roll, you know, counseling time through this interview, but what actually can you get from the, the cigar lounge, 
uh, the barbershop, you know, all those things, if you could share that, you know, with the people as well. Well, um, well, I think the best thing here is we, we do have a special selection of cigars that usually you can't get our cigars everywhere. Okay. So we have, I, we kind of go after hard to get cigars. We do have three different black owned cigar companies that we keep in our humidor. Uh, so people really love that to yeah. know that, you know, they can get some of the uh, black owned cigars they probably had once, but they can't never find it. So that's okay. one of the greatest things. We got a large selection of cigars and my partner, uh, in the in the restaurant is Chef Max. Chef Max is a, a celebrity chef around the city and around the United States. He's been on several um, uh, Food Network challenges and have won the whole thing. Okay. Dope, great food, man. He's very talented. He owns Coop, that's down in Detroit Shipping Container, yep. uh, shipping company. So he's a great asset for this space, and uh, he has a great following. But um, what I like about this place is being private, we have attracted a lot more uh, exclusive members that have been members of the DAC, have been members of La Casa and Churchill's, and they yeah. like, they don't come over here just because we're black owned, they just think it's a really dope space, yeah. and they like the, the way it feel, and that's not just by accident. I really thought about the color palettes here, and the furniture selection, and how you enter and exit the space. Yeah. So um, with that, we're uh, in some of the shipping containers just next door. Um, in the next couple of months, you will be able to do some really high-end virtual golf. So we'll have these golf simulators where you'll be able to go in and set up something with you do a, a group of four, you know, you can go in, have your own waitress, you know, bring your drinks, bring your food while you, you play a couple of rounds of golf. Come on. And uh, so that's kind of like the environment. The other stuff you have to stay tuned for. When okay. I say when you come to the Great Gatsby yeah. type of like you enter these spaces that you don't know is really a space. Right. And once you get in there, it opens up to something different. So it's all like I like these subtle surprises for people can be like, wait till you see this shit. No, you, right. you, you, when you come to Detroit, I'm gonna take you somewhere. I can't even explain this shit. That's right. You that's gotta see. That's kinda, that's what's moving me right now to see if I can do the shit, there you know? You go. Not see how, if I can, you know, put 50 million over in the North End. I just wanna do something that's the least amount as possible, but get the biggest bang for come our on. buck. Come on. But have a big influence, social Im impact. You already doing it, you, you know, and, and if, if it hasn't been said, uh, as I call myself the number one ambassador of the city of Detroit. I love when I have people come to the city where I can take them places that they can enjoy. And you right, be surprised almost. Mm -hmm. I wanted to the part where they uh, they're hollering Detroit just as loud as I am, yeah. you know, so I thank you for uh, continuing this investment, uh, for choosing to, to give back to where you came from. Uh, and, and that you continue to keep bringing your ideas to light for, for sure. everybody. You, you, and, and we're gonna get out of here, but I know you kept mentioning we, 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 and I think that's important. You know, yeah. you got a team, right? I do. Yeah, and if you yeah. want to shout some of them well, out too, man. You know that. Yeah, the work that you, and your partners and whatnot. It's funny because uh, one of my my number one teammate just walked in. Oh, okay. Gina. Okay. My girlfriend. Yeah. We, we live together. She All is. Right. Uh, uh, she's like, I don't know if I could say this, but a mini me, like okay. she can, she can rock and roll like yeah. better than some professionals. And it's not always the smartest person in the room. It's the most, uh, determined or people that got that consistent, you know, yeah. when you can consistently get tasks knocked down. Yeah. That, those are the people I look for. I don't look for people that are so super talented. I look like people that just get shit done. Like, can you get it that's, done? That's it. And can yeah. you do it for cheap yeah. and get it finished? Don't yeah. do 90%. I look for people that can do 100% yeah. and don't jack off a bunch of money and a bunch of time come on. and come back to me with results. Hey, oh. Honestly, like if she wasn't here, I would still be saying the, the same, same thing. thing. So I got her. Gina, she's helping with everything here, everything we're doing at Cocoon, which Cocoon is the co-working space. Yep. So she helps with that. 
and you know being a general manager here but then I got people like my guy Johnny he's my project manager over rebound uh, uh, design build uh, like I say chef Max uh, he's he helps you know curate our food menu and uh, help with rosemary downstairs uh, teamed up with Godwin who's the owner of Yum Village really dope brother who got a great Caribbean uh, Afrocentric food but he's helping with black coffee down the street but also curating a black park the art park that we're cool. doing yeah. so um, it's people like that um, we we and it's a it's a ton of others yeah. even my guy named Butler he's he he don't have a large skill set but he's like a Mr. Everything. Yeah. You know, he gonna get his boots dirty, yeah. he get down in sewer water, or he'll get up and change lights, or he'll dress up and be the dope man out front. Come on. But he's always accessible. That's um awesome. and a lot of people live in my properties that work for me. Yeah. And or they right in this area. So, you know, we we don't we try and hire from within yeah. most of the time, but um that's my immediate uh, group around me. My yeah. sister helps run Cocoon. So um, every chance I get, I do try to employ people that look like me. Yeah. And uh, I try to employ people that got some uh, sustainability. Come you know on. what I'm saying? And yeah. they, they have to buy into the, the whole idea of what we're trying to do, which is improve the quality of life within ourself our families and and our community like like we can do the same shit they doing i tell people that every day That's right i'm like and i'm not the smartest motherfucker around yeah it's just being able to have a vision as, and put the shit on paper and execute and execute it, bro it's cool. not well it, i'm gonna tell you yeah. man, uh super producer q and i uh we work hard to uh, to bring these stories to light we thank you for what you're doing. Uh, if there's anything that we could do to continue to support on your walk and what you're doing, because your leadership is evident. You, it's proven uh, to be uh, valuable and that it's working. And I'm glad you're doing it right here, brother. We man, thank you for that. coming to the Oh Yeah podcast with sharing oh, yeah. your story, man. And uh, we love the humble spirit about you. But today is giving you your flowers, man. Oh, it's really man, making sure we celebrate that. that. And we, we thank you. And uh, we're going to be back here because we like to enjoy a stick. In the man, drink too. stay you know tuned, I mean? man. Come, come through. Hope both of you guys become members, man. Yeah. And all the input you can, uh, we, we welcome it, man, because, uh, you know, that's that's what encourage us and keep us rolling. This is the example, man. Yep. You, you know, believing in yourself, doing it. And showing others that that's what the community is all about. Yeah. So we right. thank you, man. All right. For a show. And then show. Y'all stay looking out for us. Uh, we thank you for joining us for another episode of the Oh Yeah podcast. Signing off your boy, Mr. Oh Yeah, Detroit's number one ambassador. Right here, live from John R. Rowe. <laughs> all right. Come on. What up, good people? It's your boy, Mr. Oh Yeah. Thank you again for joining with another episode of the Oh Yeah podcast. But we wanted to add a little bit to the show uh, as I was inspired by the boy Shah from Shah vs. Everybody podcast. And when you get a chance, go check him out. He's also under the super producer Q umbrella uh, of great podcasts that are out there from the city of Detroit, state of Michigan, whatever. But he, he said something about why we do this. And whether we got a cent from this is not even the uh, uh, goal. You know, if money come, money come. But if my if I'm dead and gone, my kids can come check out some of the work that we've been doing and talking to some of the most influential leaders through the area and great talent and those who've invested in the area. Uh, but it also inspired this new segment. Oh yeah, that's what I was thinking. And we're going to just let you know or where my kids can come pick up this one day and say, this is what my dad was thinking about that. And what we're thinking about today is, of course, the Deion Sanders situation. I am a product of the HBCU community. I'm a proud graduate of Southern University. Uh, and I'm always inspired by those who come from that community and decide to give to that community. 
And what we saw was Deion Sanders, uh, in my opinion, sold us that he was doing it for the love of the black or the African-American community and just wanted to see how he could bring more attention to the HBCU community uh, and hopefully inspire others to be a part of one of the most historically uh, uh, productive community that we've ever seen in uh, the United States of America. Um, and I must say, although he did his job, I was disappointed in seeing him leave. Um, in three years, I believe he sold a mission. And within a mission, it's going to take a lot longer than three years to accomplish. Did he do great work? Absolutely. Did he bring a little more attention? Absolutely. Um, but I believe what we were sold was a man with a lifelong journey commitment. And I don't believe that came in three years. I believe that he told some of those great, talented young men that we didn't need to go to predominantly white institutions, that we could get what we were looking for right here at Jackson State University. Uh, and I believe it was prematurely exited, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, that's just my thought. Please like, share, subscribe, and let me know your thoughts on the Dion situation and all of our episodes. I hope you were able to enjoy Mr. Stephen Harris. I believe that that was a great example of consistent contribution back to your people and to your community and showing that we can do it. Please let me know your thoughts. Signing off, your boy, Mr. Oye, Detroit's number one ambassador.